The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today at our second of, uh, Wednesday of the month webinar. I'm Irene Varley, Director of Education with the Dibble Institute. And today's topic is Healthy Marriage and Relationship Education Programs for Youth, an in-depth study on federally funded programs. Joining me from Dibble on this webinar is Kathy Guidry, the wizard behind the curtain who engineers the technical side of things. Thank you, Kathy. Well, Some of you may recognize Kathy as our customer service and training manager. She's the person uh, you'll reach when calling in on the 800 number. Hey, Kathy. Hi, it's good to be here. Great, I'm glad you're there for sure. Uh, and then our featured speaker is Dr. Mindy Scott from Child Trends, and I'll be introducing her shortly. Uh, some housekeeping uh, comments for you. If you have audio difficulties during the broadcast, you can stay on the internet and phone in to hear the broadcast. That call number is listed on the webinar uh, invitation you received with the link to join us. You are muted during the broadcast, and we do hope that you have some questions or comments for Dr. Scott. As questions come to mind, please jot them down during the presentation, and we will have a Q&A following her presentation in which you can directly submit your questions in the question box located on your control panel. If you could just take a minute to see where that is. If we should run out of time and your question is not answered, believe me, we treasure your comments and we will be sure to address it directly to you after the webinar, either by email or if necessary, a phone call. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded if you wish to listen again or to send on to a colleague. You can find that recording on your home page, on our homepage, uh, and also other archived recordings, uh, you can check through the listing. Uh, there might be something that you missed in past webinars that uh, might you might find useful. In reviewing the registration list, I'm seeing that there are many new people attending today. So welcome, and I'd like to give you just a brief introduction uh, to the Dibble Institute. Well, on um, our um, PowerPoint, you can see a picture of Charlie and Helen Dibble. Yes, there is a Mr. Dibble. And Charlie, who was the founder, was an aeronautical engineer who carried his problem-solving skills back to his home community in his retirement years. He dedicated his time to working with youth on a volunteer basis. Uh, during this time in the late 80s to early 90s, he witnessed the impact the rising divorce rate was having on the youth that he served. His question then was, what are we doing to help youth thrive in spite of their negative family experiences? And I think that's an ongoing question we all have on our day to day. He sought any, he sought for research on youth, uh, trying to find uh, any research that was being conducted for youth uh, during that time. Well, when Charlie began his quest, he wasn't able to find anything of real substance. And Charlie insisted that any solutions must be backed by valid research. And most research at that time was dedicated to adult couple relationships. Subsequently, Charlie founded what was then known as the Dibble Fund, which has evolved to present day the Dibble Institute. We are a secular national 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to equipping young people with the skills and knowledge they need to develop healthy romantic relationships now and for their futures. In a way, our mantra is a teen's love life is never neutral to their future success. And we feel that Charlie would be absolutely amazed at how his quest and dedication to youth 
so many years ago has so successfully grown with the leadership of Kay Reed, our executive director, and who Charlie personally handpicked to carry on his vision. And I'm going to say that conservatively, we estimate over one and a half million youth have been reached through Dibble Institute programs over the last 10 years, which is amazing. As a mission dri driven institute, we translate research into learning tools for youth and young adults. I encourage you to visit our website to view all the materials we publish to help you and your partners serve youth and young adults. We also offer master trainings and professional development opportunities related to the development of youth, young and young adult protective factors. Next slide, Kathy. We believe, as I stated earlier, that Charlie believes in research. Therefore, you will see that all of our materials are updated and according to what the trends and research findings have told us uh, are both the needs of youth and solutions to their needs. Next slide. Uh, and, you know, uh, the ultimate end is that we want in the future stable, safe, healthy families. Isn't that why we're all doing the work we do? Next, next slide. And, you know, in order to get that, we respect that all people deserve healthy relationships. And the same uh, the principles for healthy relationships are, are there for whether the persons for all races, all ages, and also for all sexual orientation. So we respect that and the people, and you will see that um, shown in all of our curriculum. So we really appreciate all that um, Charlie has laid down a foundation for us. And in offering these free Second Wednesday webinars, we aim to carry on Charlie's mission. Well, let me introduce you to our special presenter today, Mindy Scott. She is the Deputy Program Area Director and Senior Research Scientist with Child Trends. She is involved in a number of research and evaluation projects focus, excuse me, focusing on healthy marriage, responsible fatherhood, and teen pregnancy prevention. Sounds like she's very busy. She has conducted research on adolescent and young adult relationships, the association between adolescent risky sexual behaviors and young adult rep reproductive health outcomes and healthy marriage and relationship education for teens and adults with a focus on youth in foster care, complex families, young males, and other vulnerable populations. Mindy, welcome, and thank you so much for all the valuable research you are willing to share with our audience this afternoon. Hello, thank you so much, Irene and Kathy. It's great to be here, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm really excited to talk with you today about promoting healthy relationships among youth through healthy marriage and relationship education programs. We're gonna make the connection between programs and improving re healthy relationships among youth. Next slide. We have two main objectives for today's webinar. First, to provide new knowledge about youth served by federally funded healthy marriage and relationship education programs and the implementation strategies that are used by those programs and also to provide research-based findings on best practices for serving youth in healthy marriage and relationship education programs. The content for our discussion today is based on a study that Child Trends recently completed for the Office of, Family, Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, OPRE, within the Administration for Children and Families. And the study ad addressed these two key objectives. I should note that the age range for youth in that study was 14 to 24. So we are looking at both younger and older youth into the mid 20s. And there's actually a handout, um, two handouts. One is the full report that will be 
presenting some results from that today, and then also a, a fact sheet, which is another product that came out of this study from OPRE. And looking at that second objective about best practices, just wanted to kind of define that for the group today. For, for the study, best practices reflected program implementation practices that have been identified through research and evaluation to be optimal for serving youth most effectively. So just something to keep in mind as we're uh, discussing our findings. Okay, next slide. I want to start just by providing a little bit of background to help demonstrate the motivation for the study. So first, thinking about the, the research on healthy, healthy relationships for youth uh, in, on the next slide. Research finds that romantic relationships during adolescence are developmentally appropriate and really have the potential to shape a variety of experiences during adolescence and beyond. And these experiences can be both positive and negative. Healthy marriage and relationship education or HMRE programs are designed to support youth as they navigate these relationships. And these programs can improve young people's attitudes, their knowledge, their expectations of romantic relationships, and also help them develop key skills to form healthy relationships, but also to know, rec be able to recognize and avoid unhealthy relationships. Next slide. Healthy marriage programs have been supported by the federal government for a number of years. I want to give a little bit of background about these programs specifically. The Claims Resolution Act currently provides funding for both healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood grants. And this funding is provided to communities in the form of discretionary grants. And there have been three cohorts of grantees so far, and those have been funded specifically by the Office of Family Assistance within the Administration for Children and Families, starting in 2006. A second cohort was funded in 2011, and then the most recent cohort of, of programs began in October 2015. And a number of key services and activities are implemented across the Healthy Marriage and Responsible Fatherhood grants, and these include comprehensive healthy marriage and relationship education, responsible parenting, and job and career advancement activities. So on the next slide, we have some, some more information that is um, more specific for the HMRE grants. The Claims Resolution Act authorizes eight different activities to promote family strengthening through the HMRE grants. And the activities are listed here, but I've bolded the two activities that are most relevant for programs that serve youth, and that includes education in high schools, so specifically implementing HMRE programming in high schools, and also marriage and relationship education and skills. Next slide. The federally funded HMRE programs target a number of short and long-term outcomes, ranging from improved healthy relationship and parenting skills, progress toward economic stability and poverty reduction, improved family functioning, as well as individual and child well-being. Perhaps the most relevant for youth, the most relevant outcomes for youth include improved healthy relationship skills and also a successful transition to adulthood. Next slide. Those targeted outcomes are directly related to the content of HMRE programming for youth. Among the 2011 cohort of OFA funded HMRE grantees, which will be the main focus for our discussion today, programs that serve youth in high schools tend to focus on three key aspects, the value of marriage, relationship skills, and budgeting. And this ended up being quite a large focus for the 2011 cohort, since youth in high schools was actually the largest population served across all of the grantees. So before we move to the details of the OPRE and Child Trends study about these grantees, we, we do have a poll. We wanted to learn a little bit more about the audience. Kathy, if you don't mind pulling up the poll, here we go. Um, if you are a program provider, we wanted to, to see if you currently serve youth or if you have plans to serve youth in the future. Okay, okay, so we have 
90% of folks listening in today currently serving youth and um, a, another group not currently serving youth but planning to in the future. So I see the vast majority of everyone today is already working with youth or planning to. So that's very helpful to kind of understand um, sort of the interest of the group today. And hopefully the information that we're providing will be helpful in, in your programming. Okay, next slide. So just looking a little bit more at the um, what it, the scope of federally funded programming for youth and getting a sense of what programming for youth looks like in terms of numbers, approximately half of the 60 HMRE grantees that were funded in 2011 served youth ages 14 to 24. And this translated to more than 40,000 youth being reached between 2011 and 2015. So large scale and a large number of youth being reached through these grants. However, despite this large proportion of youth served through federally funded programming, relatively little information was available about those programs. And so prior to our study, there was limited information, for example, on the characteristics of youth serving HMRE grantees, their partners, and also the youth who were participating in the program. More information also was needed about the program implementation practices employed by those grantees and the degree to which the programming for youth was informed by research. So the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, or OPRE, developed the study, which uh, was called the Youth Education and Relationship Services, or YEARS Project, to help to address some of these critical questions and, and related gaps in knowledge. And Child Trends was luckily contracted to, to lead that study. So on the next slide, we have the three key objectives to help address these research gaps. First, years aim to describe the organizations implementing federally funded HMRE programs for youth and the youth served by the programs. We collected and analyzed multiple sources of qualitative and quantitative data to help address this objective. Second, we were interested in assessing whether HMRE programming for youth aligns with practices identified through research and evaluation to be optimal for serving youth most effectively. And again, this is what we're calling our best practices. And the third objective was to identify promising approaches used by grantees to better serve youth in HMRE programs. And that was really a critical analysis of the best practices that we were looking at. So for today's presentation, though, we are really gonna focus on the first two objectives to help describe various aspects of HMRE programs and the youth they serve, and then also look uh, carefully at their implementation practices. Okay, next slide. So I wanna give a little bit of background on the specific methods for the year's study. We drew on a number of existing resources to help to identify that set of research-based best practices for serving youth that guided the study. Uh, this included a previous project that Child Trends completed, again, as a contractor to OPRE, where we developed a logic model for youth serving HMRE programs. Uh, we also reviewed and synthesized other federal reports that focus on HMRE programs for youth. And additional findings from research and evaluation related to adolescent relationships and positive youth development as well. HMRE grantees may not explicitly integrate positive positive youth development approaches into their youth programming, but we considered these approaches to be critical for effectively serving youth in general, and, and really think that they should be considered best practices for any high quality youth serving program. So based on this body of previous work, we identified a set of criteria that were then used to assess the alignment of HMRE grantee programming for youth with those best practices. And if we look on the next slide, we have some examples of those best practices criteria. And we, we found that the criteria sort of fell into three different domains, including curriculum, staff attributes and skills, and organizational practices. And there were a few subcategories within each of those three main domains. 
And we'll actually look at more examples of these criteria as we review the results from the study. So I won't go into a lot of detail here, but this is sort of the organizing framework for the best practices that we identified. Okay, next slide. And we really use these criteria to help guide the study's analysis plan and the design for our data collection instruments. And the analysis plan incorporated both quantitative and qualitative data collection, as I mentioned, and analysis from a variety of data sources with information about and from the 2011 HMRE grantees. And so those this data sources are listed here. And just quickly, we analyze grantee performance data, and that's data the grantee submitted um, biannually. And we looked at the reporting period between October 2013 and September 2014. We also reviewed grantees' applications, their performance progress reports, and profiles that, that summarize various details about each grantee's overall plans for how the, their grant funding would be used. Child Trends also collected additional data through a web-based staff, staff survey that was developed and administered as part of the study. And then we also conducted program observations and staff interviews with a, a subset of grantees. The staff survey was completed by 26 directors and eight facilitators, and that those responses represented 28 grantees that were funded in 2011. And then the observations and staff interviews were conducted with nine grantees. And we, during the, the site visits and interviews, we talked to program directors, facilitators, as well as program partners who are engaged with the grantees in delivering or supporting HMRE programming with youth. So I do wanna note um, one aspect of the design, although not part of the original study plans, um, we did end up conducting observations and grantee staff interviews with a small number of programs that were newly funded in 2015. And this was really just due to timing of data collection. And this wasn't the main focus of the study, but the, we were able to examine some of the similarities and differences between programming across the two cohorts of grantees. And it allowed us to get a sense a uh, general sense of how HMRE programming may be evolving over time. And we go into some details about those findings in the, the report. Um, and happy to talk about those a little bit more at the end if we have time. We don't cover a lot of that during today's conversation. We just wanted to point that out as one, one aspect of uh, the, what we discuss in the report itself. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna review a number of key findings across the first two research objectives from the year study and then discuss some of the implications for the findings for HMRE programming with youth. And just to refresh everyone, the first objective really was to describe the organizations that are implementing federally funded HMRE programs for youth and then also to describe the characteristics of the youth served by those programs. So we first looked at program setting. We found that grantees offered HMRE programs for youth in a variety of different settings. And here this figure summarizes the percentage of grantees operating in each of these settings. And this was reported in the staff survey. And the chart shows that HMRE programming was delivered primarily in community-based organizations or in schools during the school day. We asked about school-based programming during school and then also after school. Um, after school setting, settings were less common, um, as well as clinics and other locations. And those other locations tended to be community centers, religious centers, and also summer programs. One other thing to note is that most grantees were implementing programming in, in more than one setting. Uh, we found that half of the grantees were operating both in schools during the school day and then also in community-based organizations. And about a third of grantees were operating in school either during the school day and then also some programming after school. So we do have a second poll um, thinking about program setting. We want to hear from you. And uh, if you can select the um, 
main, I'm not sure if you're able to select more than one, but if you can select at least the main, main place where you're implementing your programming for those that are providing services, that would be very helpful. Okay, let's look at the results. So, yeah, so um, very much in line with our, our findings. We have most folks delivering programming in school during school, and then also through community-based organizations, and then a few other varieties for the other categories, um, after school or clinics or other groups. So that's good, good to see that we're sort of aligning with um, this, the broader set of uh, programs. I mean, that's out there. Okay, if we go back to the slides, we um, through the interviews that we conducted, we were able to explore more of the um, strengths and also challenges of working in, in various settings. So if we go to the next slide, we have a, a table here, and this is also in the report, where we grouped um, some of the strengths and challenges, advantages and challenges, of working in school-based and non-school-based settings. Mandy, could I ask you, as <clears throat> uh, Shira asked if uh, any of your settings included juvenile justice setting? Mm, nope, we did not, we were not able to, to speak with any grantees implementing in juvenile justice settings. Okay, thank you. Great question. Okay, so here, um, just a, a few key points. Um, in, for example, schools, in terms of advantages, uh, schools benefited when the selected curricula helped meet state core education standards and requirements. Um, and also schools seem to provide a more direct connection to both youth and parents. In terms of challenges, some grantees for, felt that school and district rules, for example, requiring active parental consent for youth participation um, was a challenge, and also the need to integrate programming into other classes sometimes hindered program implementation. Grantees that operated outside of schools tended to have more flexibility in terms of when the sessions could be scheduled. Grantees also stated that non-school-based settings may be more successful at reaching at-risk populations, uh, including young parents and disconnected youth who are out of school and not working. This is a good example of uh, setting of juvenile justice, reaching you know, quite high-risk youth in that kind of setting. Uh, one challenge to implementing non-school-based programs that was mentioned was that community program space was not always youth-friendly. Um, and so more challenging to have sort of a welcoming environment for the youth. Okay, next slide. Okay, we also collected information on the, the HMRE topics that were covered in the programs, either directly uh, on site or indirectly through referrals with other organizations. And the values are a little off here, but you can see high numbers across all of the, the categories. Um, most grantees reported that they addressed a, a few specific topics on site that are related to HMRE programming, including attitudes and beliefs about healthy romantic relationships, healthy relationship skills and behaviors, marriage and cohabitation, and then that last column is parenting and co-parenting skills. And the value for that is a little lower, 79% for parenting and co-parenting skills, but still quite high. A sizable percent of the grantees also address these topics through an established community partner. So in general, we were finding that these types of HMRE topics were, were very common and were addressed through multiple methods by the grantees, both on site and then also through partners. On the next slide, we look at some other, other content and oh, sorry about the, the values here. Um, Generally, we see here that a smaller but still quite substantial proportion of grantees address other topics. And these topics reflect some of the other goals and outcomes related to HMRE programming. If we think about that slide that we saw earlier, um, where we had the longer list of outcomes, and these included financial management, education and career success, extended family relationships, and housing as well. And 
uh, here the values range from 79% for financial management and then um, down to 25% for housing. Okay, next slide. We found quite a bit of variability in the curricula being implemented and also the number of curriculum that youth serving grantees offered to address these various HMRE topics. And some grantees reported using up to 15 different curricula in their program to address everything. Here we have a, a summary of the most frequently reported curricula implemented by the 2011 cohort of grantees. And I, I cut this table off at um, curricula that were offered by at least three grantees. Uh, there, there were a number of other curricula that were offered by maybe one or two different grantees. So we just cut this up at three. Um, some of the most commonly implemented curricula were the prep curricula within our reach and within my reach. Uh, also how to the PIC curriculum, how to avoid falling for a jerk. And then also a number of Dibble Institute curricula, um, Love You Too, Connections, Love Notes, and Relationship Smart. So, um, a lot, a lot of diversity in the types of curricula being implemented. Also um, to note, most of the grantees did report that they selected evidence-based curricula and about half noted that the curricula that they selected were age appropriate, that that was a, a, a goal and focus of um, their selection of what they were implementing, that it was age appropriate for their population. Okay, next slide. Okay, program directors reported on the ages of their participants, and we we were interested in the proportion of participants at each site who were younger youth, 14 to 17, older youth, 18 to 24, and then 25 and years old and older. And here this chart's a little complicated, but we show the number of grantees who report whether none, less than 50%, 50 to 74, 4% or 75% or more of their participants were in each category. And I, I think the main takeaway here is that you can see that no programs reported that the majority of their participants, so more than 50%, were 18 to 24 years old. And these this age group was more likely to be served along with either younger youth or mixed in with adults who were 25 years or older. And to us, that, that seemed to suggest uh, some service gaps for this older age group. If programs are targeting and serving 18 to 24 year olds, but they're sort of mixed in with the younger and older participants. Okay, next slide. Looking just at the grantees who served primarily youth, and so here is where um, we looked at programs are serving 75% or more of all of their programs participants were 14 to 24. We found for this group that there roughly there was a breakdown of roughly half uh, female and half male um, youth being served. Next slide. We explored the characteristics of the youth um, a bit further. Um, we we asked grantees about the target populations, um, and this was also pulled from grantee profiles as well as interviews. Um, we did find that overall grantees targeted and served quite a diverse and often disadvantaged populations of youth. We have a number of examples here. Um, just to highlight some, youth, we heard that grantees were targeting youth whose parents struggle with addiction, youth with incarcerated parents, youth in poverty, homeless youth, immigrant and minority populations, and also pregnant and parenting youth. And then on the next slide, we had uh, some questions about characteristics of youth populations also in the staff survey. And these groups don't completely overlap with the populations that staff identified in the interviews, but I think just further provide indication of the diverse types of youth being served. Many grantees served a majority of youth living in poverty and also single youth or youth that aren't in relationships. Um, but a smaller subset of grantees served youth in more specialized populations, and this did include youth in, in current relationships. They, the programs weren't necessarily serving both partners, so couples at the same time, but the youth were in current relationships. 
as well as young parents and also victims of abuse. Okay, next slide. To further describe the programs, we examined several aspects of training. All grantees reported that facilitators received at least one hour of program-specific training. Over a third reported that facilitators received between 21 and 30 hours of program-specific training. And 16% uh, reported more than 30 hours of training. So a good range of, uh, in terms of the number of hours of training. On the next slide, we show a few different types of training. And here we are focusing on trainings that relate to program facilitation and program delivery. Training on program content, delivery, and facilitation were among the most common training topics. And then also training on logic models and theory of change and establishing professional boundaries were also common. On the next slide, we looked at areas where director, program directors felt that more training was needed. And, and although directors reported that most or all facilitators received some training on things like logic model and theory of change development and group facilitation that we saw on the previous slide, the directors also reported that more training was needed in these areas. And fewer directors reported that facilitators needed additional training in things like program content and establishing professional boundaries. Okay, next slide. So the findings we just looked at, and there's a, a, a number of other descriptive findings about the characteristics of programs in the report as well. We look at um, things like recruitment and retention strategies, the use of technology in programming, um, whether the curricula that are being implemented are different for younger and older youth. There's a, those are a few examples of other things we look at in the report. They really helped us to describe the characteristics of the HMRE programs and their participants, but I want to move on now to the second objective, um, assessing whether HMRE programming for youth aligns with research-based best practices. Um, and again, as a reminder, the best practices were drawn from a review of published and unpublished research and evaluation studies that assess key components of HMRE programs for youth, as well as positive youth development approaches. And on the next slide, we have really our, our key takeaway. Um, and a key finding um, is that the vast majority of grantees, over 80% uh, for all, across all criteria, agreed that their organizations were implementing a range of best practices for serving youth. And these reports are very consistent across directors and facilitators and very positive. And across the next few slides, we'll review some examples of the best practices uh, criteria that we explored uh, through the survey and through the interviews. And, and on the next slide, you can see an example of the high, high level of reports um, of these practices being in place. For example, here we, we see that nearly all directors, 96% um, for some of these, or agreed or strongly agreed that their programs had clear goals, had a logical sequencing of program content and activities, and included sharing and listening activities. And so these are examples of some of the best practices criteria. On the next slide, we have a few more. Uh, we found that most grantees reported Practices that fostered positive youth interactions, including targeting specific needs of the youth served and valuing diverse relationships and family backgrounds. On the next slide, we see that grantees demonstrated considerable efforts to be inclusive of diverse groups of youth, with most directors, these are based on director reports, reporting that their programs used activities and materials that were representative of the youth being served, were inclusive of LGBTQ youth, and had content that was appropriate for a broad range of youth. Fewer grantees reported engaging parents in their programming or including youth directly in decision-making with 
only about a third of directors reporting this practice, um, engaging youth in decision making, which is drawn from a positive youth development framework and really is meant to emphasize the value of creating leadership opportunities for youth. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to just focus a little bit more on the topic of inclusivity, in, which is something we explored during the staff interviews. And grantee staff described different approaches that they used to make sure their programming was culturally appropriate and relevant for their populations. And some examples include hiring staff with similar racial ethnic backgrounds as the youth served, using research-based approaches for serving youth, using curricula that are developed specifically for their youth populations, and incorporating relevant content like discussing co-parenting relationships when working with pregnant and parenting teens. So this you know, kind of points to the value of knowing your population, knowing the needs of the population, and then tailoring your activities and curricula to that group using research-based approaches. And the next slide, um, here we explored the this, uh, decision-making and leadership opportunity component a bit more. Um, uh, the, although the staff survey results did suggest that grantees are not creating leadership opportunities for youth to the extent that they're following other implementation best practices. We, we saw some very clear examples of this type of practice when exploring this topic a bit more during the staff interviews. And here are just a few different quotes that describe some of the ways that grantees were creating leadership opportunities for their youth. Uh, for example, one grantee talked about engaging youth in program-related decisions, including decisions about what is working and what is not working in the lessons. And another grantee talked about engaging youth in decisions about how to approach the material that's covered in a program and really um, providing ownership to the youth um, in, in shaping their programming. Okay, and then the next slide, we, we looked at various aspects of organizational capacity, including the capacity for grantees to monitor whether the pro their program is being implemented the way it was designed to be implemented, and um, referring to this as fidelity. And most grantees were implementing procedures to monitor program fidelity and appeared to be using this information to support program improvement efforts. For example, this slide shows that 72% of directors reported that grantee staff conducted ongoing reviews of program documents to determine whether the program content was delivered as intended. And over half used fidelity data to support continuous quality improvement most or all of the time. And nearly half of grantees reported that they conducted observations to monitor fidelity. On the next slide, we also looked um, at similar measures of, uh, of program monitoring program quality, including the use of corrective feedback to improve program quality, completing a form after each lesson to systematically assess quality and uh, conducting observations. And these results are quite similar to the fidelity results where we, we have uh, monitoring practices in place, but fewer grantees conducting formal observations to monitor quality. Okay, so in, in the next slide, we'll um, get into our conclusions and recommendations. I know that was a lot of information um, to share, but wanted to just highlight a, a lot of different um, points and topics that we, we assessed through the year study. Um, and the findings really uh, from the study are meant to inform the Administration for Children and Families, as well as the broader HMRE research and practice fields about youth serving HMRE programs. And so drawing on key findings from each of our research object objectives, we developed a number of recommendations for supporting the des design and implementation of HMRE programs. So on the next slide, we have our, some of our recommendations. We, for example, found that HMRE grantees serve youth in diverse settings as, as we um, saw from some of the findings and, and also that many programs were implemented in both school and community-based settings. And um, knowing that each setting has unique advantages but also some challenges, a uh, recommendation could be to 
um, establish community partnerships and implement in multiple settings to help overcome some challenges uh, faced in certain settings. However, programs may need some extra support in implementing in multiple settings in the community. Programs may also need support in reaching and serving older youth ages 18 to 24, um, in, and especially using age and developmentally appropriate curricula for that group. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, youth ages 18 to 24, we saw were more likely to be served with younger youth or mixed in with adults, which, which means that programming was not necessarily designed or really tailored to, that, to the needs of that age group. On the next slide. Um, here we, uh, we saw that grantees were quite thoughtful in their selection of their curriculum, in their recruitment and retention strategies, and their implementation practices. And although many grantees had tailored their programs to better meet the, meet the needs of their youth served, and were already implementing practices identified through research to be optimal for serving youth, Grantees may benefit from ongoing education and training related to the youth, unique needs of youth. And this includes considerations for specific youth in, in grantees' communities, and it also selecting curricula that are age and developmentally appropriate, and following best practices specifically uh, for serving youth. And this may be particularly valuable for programs that are serving a mix of youth and adults. Next slide. A few spe specific program implementation areas were identified for additional training. These included integrating positive youth development approaches, such as providing skill building opportunities, providing youth with leadership opportunities, and including youth in decision making. And also think thinking at the about the findings around organizational structure and capacity. Um, conducting observations on an ongoing basis to monitor program curriculum fidelity and quality to inform program improvement efforts is another area where additional training and support might be needed. The next slide. So that concludes the summary of the findings from the presentation. Um, as I mentioned, we I know we covered a lot of details. There's more even more information in the uh, report and a set of technical appendices along with the report. There's a, a, this slide has a link to the year's project website, which is on ACF's main site. And here's where you can find more information about the study, including the two publications I mentioned. Those are also in your handout section, though. Um, the report and then also a fact sheet that we developed earlier uh, in the study, uh, which provided some kind of more brief information about uh, youth characteristics and the curricula and other implementation practices um, implemented by the grantee. So we we have time for questions. Um, I'd also be really interested in hearing about other examples of promising approaches that you have seen um, in your work serving youth, um, specific strategies that have been successful, examples of challenges, um, and just happy to address any of your questions. Okay, so if you could uh, type in in your question box any questions or comments, uh, as Mindy just suggested, um, please do so now. And while that's happening, Mindy, I just wondered, um, were there any grantees that you interviewed uh, that had a very common missing element in their programming that you noticed? Or were able to collect data on? No, you know, nothing, nothing sort of systematic stood out um, in terms of missing elements. Um, what, what we didn't go into detail here is the, that last objective where we did some critical analyses and um, that kind of speaks to your question where we, we looked across all of our different cr criteria and saw that almost all of the grantees were really meeting criteria um, in terms of the curriculum related content delivery and also um, staff attributes and skills uh, there, but there were a few 
criteria. So not 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 any specific grantee, but um, mm -hmm. across the grantees, a few a few things in those in the staff attributes and organizational practices criteria that I would say um, fewer grantees were meeting that. Um, some examples were um, having staff with similar racial ethnic characteristics and background as the youth. That was something that um, fewer grantees were able to meet that criteria. And then as we saw the um, capacity of the organization to um, monitor and address fidelity, equality, and evaluation activities. Um, there were, that was sort of where fewer grantees were able to meet the criteria, but overall really positive um, and consistent um, mm -hmm. responses across the program. Thank you. Well, I'm not getting, uh, seeing any more questions uh, coming up. Uh, in your uh, handout of the study, mm -hmm. the complete study, do you list all of the programs uh, that uh, different uh, grantees have been using, or do you just list the ones that you showed on the screen? We have a larger table in the in the report. It um, it still may not capture all of the curricula. We base that on um, what we could learn from the grantees. Um, profiles and from their progress reports. So if they were, if the curricula were listed in the progress reports, they're on there, but it may not capture everything, but I there see. is a, mm -hmm. a, a bit more comprehensive list in the report. Okay. So, because uh, uh, one of the uh, participants asked for a specific program and uh, it was not listed there. So I wanted okay, to yeah. he can look at that and see if it's listed if there were others who were using the program she was concerned about so yeah i can i can um let's see i can go to that table i have the report right here let's see hm. having trouble locating it in the report well, that's fine. I think if um, okay, happy to I follow up on that too. Those that yes, and uh, we uh, so uh, Carolyn will uh, follow up with that on for you. Okay, well, uh, thank you so very much, Mindy. And I think possibly this could be very useful in writing grants and um, planning future programs, relationship education programs for upcoming grants that are going to be coming out yet this fall, this spring, and possibly even next year. So um, I hope that uh, everyone found that valuable information. Kathy, you have some parting words for our audience? Yeah, so again, thank you so much, Mindy, for all that uh, valuable information. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. At the end of this uh, webinar, when you turn off, there'll be a brief survey that we appreciate if you would um, answer that for us. If you have any questions, we will be back in touch with you if we did not um, have the answers for you or address those uh, questions live here. Um, I did record the webinar, and I hope to have it up. I will have it up by Monday afternoon under our webinar tab on our website. If you have any specific questions that Irene or I can answer, please either give us a call or you see our emails right there and we'll be glad to help you. Um, you see our website here is uh, dibbleinstitute.org. Please, you can go to the website and you can subscribe to our newsletters. You'll get all the up-to-date information on relationship education and the Dibble Institute. Uh, speaking of social media, like us on Facebook, follow us on LinkedIn, and again, there's our phone number and our business email. And as I said, speaking of social media, I'm very excited next month um, for our free second Wednesday webinar in May to have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Temple. He is the uh, licensed psychologist and the director of behavioral health and research at the University of Texas Medical Branch in the OBGYN department. He has been um, working closely and studying the subject of sexting, cyberbullying, and adolescent relationships. And as we all know, social media is where the young people are. And so hopefully we'll learn some things from uh, Dr. Temple about 
how relationships are being formed through good and bad things through social media. So anyway, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And you have a good day. And look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you so much, Mindy, Kathy. Thank you. Thank and everybody. everyone who participated today or listened in. Thank you so much.